Welcome to WesleyGospel.com. Uh, this is Biblical Economics 6, and I'm going to go over uh, this today's subject will be on uh, saving money with a frugal budget. So last uh, the last video was on increasing income with hard work. This one is about saving money with a frugal budget. Now, I'm not going to get into advanced investing concepts. That will be uh, the goal of my next biblical economics video, which I don't plan to release for several months because I have a lot to learn in that area. But I can get over the uh, the basic concept of a uh, budget uh, today, as well as a uh, an emergency fund. So all those two concepts uh, merge together into one in this uh, saving money with a frugal budget. So let's get started. All right, um, I'm going over my notes here, I'm putting together a manuscript right now. So it's page 90. Yee. Um, I uh, two two opening uh, scriptures for this one. Um, Proverbs 27:23. Be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds. And Proverbs 13:11, whoever gathers money little by little makes it grow. Um, these two verses are great um, verses for budgeting and saving money in a gradual manner. So, um, flocks and herds um, are are referring to uh, sheep and cattle. Um, in biblical times, um, a lot of the um, a lot of the the men were were um, livestock traders. Uh, they might have had uh, other businesses on the side, but oftentimes they they uh, they traded livestock. They traded sheep. They traded they traded uh, uh, steak cows. Um, and they were it was a form of money. And uh, today, any livestock trader, any livestock farmer, views essentially their their flocks and their herds as as a form of money. They see. They see a, a sheep and they see 700 bucks. They see a cow, they see a thousand bucks, and uh, and so that's why they brand these animals because you know it's uh, um, it's money, you know just just like um, you know how we put we put imprints on on our dollars. So it's important for us to know the condition of our flocks and give careful attention to our herds to know exactly how many sheep you have. Uh, how many cattle you have because if you're not um, if you don't know the condition of them are they healthy are things going well uh, how much are there of each of them um, uh, are they being fed well are they being cared for um, so this definitely applies to money today uh, you know flocks and herds were, were were money just as much as gold and silver was money back in Old Testament times and so um, we today, you know, almost all of our money has been turned into an online banking format, electronic money. And now you're hearing about stuff like Bitcoin, but whatever forms money takes, whether it's cash, gold, silver, stocks, bonds, flocks, herds, whatever forms they take, uh, Bitcoins, cryptocurrencies, um, it's still the same thing. I mean, it just it takes all these different forms. People who invest in commodities, like silver, gems, jewelries, diamonds, etc., that's all money. I mean, it can be if it can be bought, and then it can be held, and then it can be sold. It's it's money. I mean, it's just it's the same thing. It just takes on a bunch of different forms. And so when he's saying Proverbs 27, 23, be sure you know the condition of your flocks, be care give careful attention to your herds, might as well say, be sure you know the condition of your silver, give careful attention to your gold, be sure you know the condition of your Bank of America accounts, give careful attention to your checking accounts, be sure you know the condition of your checking accounts, give careful attention to your savings accounts, etc. Uh, whatever forms money takes, just change the words flocks and herds around, and you you have a teaching on a budget here. And what is that teaching? That teaching is knowing the condition of it and giving careful attention to it. You know where you stand, whether you're 
this strong or this weak. You know when certain incomes are coming and when certain expenses are going out. You're giving careful attention to it. I think even uh, once a day, you should be looking at your Bank of America accounts. And I say accounts in the plural, uh, because if you have a budget pie and you're and you're dividing it up into different sections, there should be different accounts that you're transferring into uh, every time you get paid. And then of one of those accounts should be a savings account. Now CPAs, certified public accountants, CFPs, certified financial planners, generally recommend that. Um, saving should be 20% of your paycheck. Now, if you're working for a company and they give you a 401k plan for your retirement savings, that means they're taking 10% out of your paycheck for your retirement in the future. However, then they'll say, but you need to also save an additional 10% um, for your emergency fund. Um, so now, if you're not getting a 401k or a IRA or any sort of a retirement fund, you should have just a generic sort of idea that you're saving at least 20% of your of your um, of your of your paycheck for multi-purpose saving purposes. Now, uh, when I say multi-purpose reasons, um, and this gets into deep deep investing concepts, which I I can't really speak with a whole lot of accuracy right now, but I can say this. The first thing that you should do with that 20% is try to build an emergency fund. This is definitely agreed upon by um, CPAs. Take a look at this book. Okay. Um, this book is called Budgeting 101 by Michelle Kagan. As you can see, the bottom it says CPA. All right. So, um, She's just one of many CPAs that that recommend that uh, uh, you know everybody should save 20% of their paycheck and build an emergency fund. Okay, so what is an emergency fund? It is only to be used for job loss or car repairs, not really to be used for anything else. Um, some people like to say it should be used for extreme medical bills, but um, in one in one way or another, people have medical debts that come and go, and and debt repayment should be part of one of the uses of of savings. But that that is really a thing in itself, and may or may not be what you want to use your savings for. I would say that uh, nine times out of ten, an emergency fund should be um, should be left alone, and should be only dipped into in the event that there's job loss or car repairs. Um, so how much should the emergency fund be? They generally say three months of living expenses is the bare minimum. You can go higher than that if you want to, but the bare minimum, the goal, the low water mark, is three months of living expenses. So if you live on $6,000 a month, that's how 6,000 times three should be your goal, which is $18,000. So how are you gonna save $18,000? Well, they say it should be three months of living expenses. So um, how are you gonna to get to that point, All right? Well, conventional wisdom, most people, most CPAs recommend that emergency funds should be, um, it's all electronic money. So it's all, uh, you know, bank, bankofamerica.com. And, and that the emergency fund should be in a savings account on your website, on your Bank of America. And that uh, you should just simply transfer the money every, t every time it, uh, you get a direct deposit into your checking account. You should just simply tr transfer 20% of that into that savings account every time you get paid. And theoretically, that the savings account should uh, you should not be able to pull anything out of it unless you go to the bank and ask the teller in person. There should be no debit card connected with that savings account, and uh, and that so that you're not tempted 
to dip into it with withdrawals. So that's generally the idea that you create an online savings account that you can't access unless you physically go to the bank and talk to the teller and ask for some money from it. However, um, I, I take a different approach towards building an emergency fund and uh, I, I, could, I could see why people might differ with me on this. Um, but, you know, if, if money is money, no matter what form it comes in, um, then, you know, I don't think it should matter if I build an emergency. I believe in building an emergency fund a different way. And um, some people agree with me on this. And uh, so because I've been studying the history of Puritan uh, biblical economics and the, the, the biblical understanding of saving, um, as you as you may know, maybe I'm I'm just a little old-fashioned, maybe I'm just a little uh, too much into historical uh, economics, or maybe I'm just a little bit too conservative. Maybe I'm just a little too committed to principles that are time-tested. But they clearly the time-tested way to save money is through saving silver coins and gold coins. I mean, ever since the time of Abraham in the book of Genesis, all the way up through the New Testament in the book of Revelation, you can see silver and gold. Silver and gold, collectively, if you put them together, appear about 700 times in the Bible. And that's what you call bullionism. Bullionism. Uh, the idea that, um, that a person's wealth is measured by how, men, how much silver and gold that they own. Um, and uh, the Puritans lived in a time of bullionism. The Reformers lived in a time of bullionism. The Catholic saints lived in a time of bullionism. John Wesley lived in a time of bullionism. Bullionism stopped in the early 1900s uh, uh, because uh, John Maynard Keynes said gold is dead, and everybody believed this guy for a while. Of course, the California gold rush happened in the late 1800s, and the Great Depression happened in the 1930s, and guess what happened? All the banks were failing, and so President FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, confiscated all of the nation's gold, almost all of the nation's gold, except for historical coins, and melted them into gold bars and put them in gold and Fort Knox. And then he issued out a whole bunch of government programs because of all the gold that was confiscated. And he issued out, and he didn't steal the gold. Uh, I mean, he didn't steal the value. I mean, he gave people, you know, money, uh, dollar bills for their gold. But um, people were not able to own gold from 1933 all the way up to like 1976. So it says in this book, uh, The Essential Guide to Investing in Precious Metals by David Gantz. Uh, and that was called uh, Executive Order 6102. And people, if they did not hand over their gold bullion coins and their gold bars over to the government, they were to be fined $10,000 or put in prison for 10 years. So guess what happens? Fort Knox filled up pretty quickly. Banking is based on gold vaults. If, if banks did not have gold vaults, they would not have the financial power to write these IOU notes called dollar bills to people. When people walk around with some cash and they walk around with a dollar bill, they're essentially, uh, I mean, this is a simplistic way to look at it. It's more complicated than that because everybody's pulling their money. In different forms, digital money, and you know, all kinds of stuff. But I will say this: at the very base of it, when people are walking around with the dollar bill in their way, that's a, actually a fraction of the gold that exists in that bank's in that bank's gold vault. Bank of America has a gold vault. Uh, uh, Truist has a gold vault. Fort Knox has a gold vault, and every bank has a gold vault at one place or another. Um, that doesn't mean every little regional bank in you know in the local town has one, but I'm saying in their headquarters somewhere they've got gold vaults somewhere. 
and uh, gold is the purest form of money there is on earth. Now, any economist would agree with me on that. Now, I know that money takes different forms, that's true, but gold is always the, the root upon which the tree of currency branches out. Now we got a Bitcoin over here, but at the bottom of it is gold. You know, money doesn't grow on trees, but gold grows in mines. And so when we destroy dollar bills and Bitcoins and e-money and uh, um, Biden decides to freeze Russia's banks and all these banks are frozen because internet websites won't work for them. If they still have gold, they still have money. So gold is the, the primitive form of money, always has been pretty much from the foundation of the world. And uh, um, so that being said, I believe that saving silver and gold is the most tried and true method of building an emergency fund. And believe it or not, there are highly reputable uh, dealers in silver and gold bullion that you can just buy it from off the internet. And so I found one place called moneymetals.com and they sell uh, silver coins. There's a coin that I personally like they've decided to um, commit to, to build an emergency fund off of. I shopped around it for several months and finally found one that I like enough to say, I'm going to build an emergency fund out of that thing, that coin, and I'm just going to keep you know, taking my 20% and just keep investing my money in that until I have filled up what they call a monster box. Now, um, so uh, this is coin that I have here, okay, is called, this is called the Canadian, whoop, whoopsies. This is one ounce of silver. This is called the Canadian um, maple leaf coin with Elizabeth the second on it, they says five dollars, but it's really worth thirty-three dollars. And it has a, a Canadian maple leaf on it. Now, why do I go with that? This one, um, because number one, it's harmless. It's got a harmless design on it. Um, number two, it's highly traded. Um, it's a very popular, very well recognized silver coin. Um, number three. It's not cost prohibitive. I mean, it's just 30 bucks a piece. So I actually have currently on my desk right here $150 worth of silver coins. Okay, it's five, uh, five silver coins, one ounce silver coins, uh, about $30, $30 each. So if you do five times 30, that's $150 worth of silver. And what you do is you put them in these little these little tubes, these little container tubes, okay, and um, you fill them up like this, and they go up uh, to 25. And once they've filled up to the 25 mark, you times that by 30, you have about $750 worth of silver. I have a little safe that I put that in. And so I'll buy this stuff incrementally when um, as I, you know, in keeping with my income, take the 20% off, buy some silver, blah, 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 put it in my safe. And then once a tube fills up, because I don't want to keep this in the house, what if a burglar comes by, right? Uh, which, of course, I have a shotgun <laughs> to, in, in the event that happens. But still, you know, I, I don't want lots of uh, commodity hanging around my house. It's too much to worry about. So... Once a tube fills up, I go to the bank and I put it in my safe deposit box. And believe it or not, that's the way the Puritans saved in the 17th century. So I'm just copying the Puritans. <laughs> that's what they did. They had a safe. They called them a strong box back there. Or the pirates, they called them a treasure uh, chests. But that was the age of bullionism. That was before uh, the stock market became the primary way of saving and investing. and Electronic money kicked in and all this stuff. So, um, you know, the gold rush, you know, 
well up into the early early 1900s people were using gold and silver as the way to consolidate their wealth to put it into a form that was not easy to spend it was easy to consolidate the money into a solid form that you could put somewhere and put it in a safe spot and for, try to forget about it so you don't dip into it keep on withdrawing you know how else can you save if you don't with you know the saving of the money comes from not withdrawing the money not using the money so turning it into a um turning it into a commodity instead of a fluid spendable currency is the key to saving money according to the bible according to bullionists like the puritans who believed in the bible and just simply did what they saw the bible doing well abraham lots of, had lots of silver and gold so i'll have lots of silver and gold and so i feel the same way and i was just um it was coincidental really because I got into this silver and gold thing months ago, but this this magazine came out, Forbes, just just uh, last month, and there's an article in there by a bullion dealer about a bullion dealer. He was from Russia, and the name of this article is "From Russia with Gold," and this guy is saying, "Look." It's great if you want to have online stocks, you know, like Robinhood or, you know, if you want to have online savings like in your Bank of America, okay, but you need to at least have some of your assets in silver and gold because what if you end up like, you know, with a frozen bank account someday and you can't access your money? Right? Look what Biden did to, to Putin. He just froze his bank accounts. He can't access his money on his internet website. But then what the guy says is that, yeah, but Russia's hoard of gold is still is still good. All they have to do is take their gold to China and sell it, and now they have money that they can use. And so the idea that, you know, um, gold is a way of consolidating your money without having it to be connected to software without having it to be connected with fintech and online websites and and um, computer errors and frozen bank accounts and all kinds of hackers and identity thefts and stuff like that it's a way of making your 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 wealth totally in a solid indestructible state now you need to put it in the safe spot you need to put it in the bank um, now banks can be robbed it's true and I, I haven't looked into this is it possible to get insurance on your gold probably i haven't looked into this but i don't have that much yet i've just started with you know saving through precious metals and i think it's a great idea i really do um so um budget pies i'm going to speak a piece on budget pies um bank transfers so this comes from the world of CPAs and CFPs. You know, percentages of how much you should save for each category of spending can differ from person to person, but um, there are there are um, and when I say from person to person, I say from CPA to CFP, two individuals. I mean, and I think that you should you should have some flexibility with the percentages on your budget pie. And this is how I do it. I have about eight different checking accounts on Bank of America now, and each of them have a name. One of them uh, is the, the entertainment. One of them's groceries. One of them's home expenses. One of them's insurance. One of them's um, self-employment taxes. One of them's just for money metals. One of them is for rent. And it goes like this. Um, all of them have percentage figures on them. So I know that you know they can't go they can't exceed 100 percent so i have my entertainment is uh four percent groceries 19 percent home expenses eight percent insurance seven percent taxes 20 percent money metals 20 percent rent 14 percent i think i've changed some of those and i went over 100 there <laughs> i've changed some of those around since then but you get my drift 
um, I put these percentages in my book. Um, I actually give a couple of percentage plans um, with that because um, they differ, you know, but there's certain things that you don't. Uh, and, and then there's the uh, what they call the 50, 20, 30 rule. Uh, this idea is based off of um, you put 50 percent towards. Well, hold on just a sec. 50% of your paycheck goes towards housing payments, car payments, groceries, insurance, healthcare, minimum debt payments, and utility bills. Okay, that's really vague, like, because <laughs> those things need to be broken down into subcategories and percentages, really. So, um, and then 30% of your paycheck should be for, like, entertainment and household expenses, and then 20% for savings. All right, that's not really giving you a whole lot of guidance. Um, I really like this article by J.J. Montanaro. He's a CFP for soldiers in the military. There was an article on military.com called What Does Your Budget Pie Look Like? Really great article, really great place to start to get some percentages for a budget pie. Um, highly recommend that article. It's called, uh, it's on military.com and it's called What Does Your Budget Pie Look Like? by J.J. Montanaro totally look at the that budget pie it's very well done um, and it might not be perfect you might want to make tiny little adjustments later on as you go but you know that's the idea of basically the idea of watching over your flocks and herds right every time you get a paycheck you're going to transfer a certain slice you're going to get out your calculator and you're going to do a percentage equation like 0.10 times you know, $600, which was my weekly paycheck, equals $60. Okay, so now I'm going to take that 10%, which is $60, and I'm going to put it into some category, like maybe um, home expenses or something. And then, as you, and then you have all these different places to park your money into different categories so that, you know, you're not just putting it in one checking account and, you know, money's just constantly being withdrawn. You don't know how to keep track of all of it. It's easier to control the money and to hold the money if you park it in a bunch of different little accounts. And that's the key to budgeting, really. It's a very simple concept that whenever you get paid in the main checking account, you make sure to do your bit, your transfers, you know, every time you get paid. It's different percentage amounts. And it's such a simple thing. I wish I was told that early on um, how to do that. Um, and believe it or not, the Puritans did that. Listen to this quote from Richard Baxter. He said, it seemeth the Protestant, now he didn't use any, he didn't use any percentages. Listen to this. This guy was from the 1670s. He said, it seemeth the prudis, prudent, prudent, <laughs> prudentest way, it seemeth the prudentest way to divide my expenses according to the proportion of others of my quality some to the poor and some to necessary charges and some to actions of due civility where God hath made many duties constantly necessary as to maintain your own bodies, your own children, your children to pay tribute to the King, to help the poor, to maintain the charges of the church. There all must be wisely proportioned, but entertainments, recreations and other such after to be mentioned, which are not constant duties, may be sometimes good and sometimes sinful. That's Chapters from a Christian Directory, page 162, 163. Uh, so he's talking about dividing up your expenses, and that makes you think of uh, Ecclesiastes 11.2, give a portion to seven, also to eight. Um, you know, that's a great, you know, have eight different categories of uh, savings. Um, that you're use, that you're using regularly, um, or eight different checking accounts. You just want to protect your money from impulsive McDonald's and Starbucks spending. Um, you know, don't just have it all in one you know melting pot. That's a bad idea. Um, uh, so you know, have multiple checking accounts, flocks, herds, plural. You know. Um, so anyway, that's my thoughts right now. You, you have a budget. You park, park that money in a bunch of different little spending accounts, and you save that gold and silver every, you know, every, from 20% from of, your, of your paycheck. It's a gradual thing. He that, he that uh, uh, saves money little by little makes it grow.
All right, well, that's, that's enough for today on the budget and saving money uh, for the emergency fund.